said, a long time, okay? So I'm going to talk about research that I've done, uh, and hopefully it'll give you kind of a feel about how research is done at a university and opportunities for you to get involved. Because at the end of the day, as professors and researchers, we don't actually get in the lab and do anything. We go and define the projects, and we get the, the funding, and then we hire students, and the students are the ones that actually go in and do it. Okay? So as, you, as I talk about everything that's, that I've done with my team, you can imagine yourself doing something very similar. Okay? All right, so a little bit about myself. I'm actually from Billings, Montana. Any West High Bears in here? One, <laughs> two, a couple? All right, so I was, yeah, I was born just down the road in Billings, uh, West High graduate. Uh, I came and got my graduate or my uh, electrical engineering degree from MSU back in 98. And then I went to work for Hewlett Packard in Colorado Springs, where I designed electronic test equipment for the computer industry. And while I was there, like most big companies do, they pay for you to go take classes nights and weekends. So I just started taking a class here and there and kind of chipped away at my master's degree and then ended up getting my PhD. And then at, the, at some point I was like, wow, I'm actually qualified to be a professor. Maybe I should be a professor. I love teaching and I loved you know, tinkering around. So I became a professor. And I came to MSU, this is my 18th year and it's been kind of a blink of the eye, but it's been also pretty sweet. So, my research interest is in just computers, right? So just the general area of making computers better. So when you have research, a research thread, it's always like, why do you research? Why do you do research in that area? So computers are kind of funny. They're they're not too difficult to motivate. It's kind of like food. What would you do without food? What would you do without your phone? Okay, you'd have a, a just freak out, right? You couldn't live without it. So any like research that you can do to improve any aspect of a computer has a very broad impact, okay? So if you look at a computer, most people tend to think about like a laptop, right? Or maybe like what we call a workstation, which is the box and a monitor. And today, everybody also thinks about their cell phone, which is true, that is a computer. And there's a lot of these sold. Right, so workstations, things that are like up here, you know, there's like 300, 400 million a year sold of these, okay? Smartphones, there's like one to two billion sold, right? But there's also computers everywhere else in your life. So what about the computers that are in all of electronics? So think about, there's computers in this little thingamajig, there's a computer up in that projector, that projector, the lights that I dimmed, that was a computer, there's probably like 20 computers up here just running all the little electronics. It turns out these computers are called embedded computers, and there's a lot of them, okay? There's over 30 billion of these sold every year. For reference, does anybody know how many people are on Earth? Eight billion. Eight billion. And every year, we sell 32 billion, okay? So every human being has like 20, 30, 40 computers that are helping us live, all right? So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And so it's just an exciting field to be part of because you don't have to advance the whole thing. You can just advance some little slice and it'll have a big impact, okay? All right, so the question is like, okay, what's wrong with our computers? They're awesome. I go buy a new phone, it runs fast, right? I get a new laptop, it's fast. So one of the reasons that our computers are so awesome is because we have been riding this wave that's called Moore's Law for 40 or 50 years. Moore's Law is named after a guy named Gordon Moore, who was a founder of Intel. Anybody heard of Intel? Yeah, all the chips, that's where they come from. So he noticed this trend that they kept making transistors smaller and smaller, and it was like about every 18 to 24 months, you would double the number of transistors on a particular little integrated circuit. <clears throat> and this was due to, they just shrunk, and then you could also make the circuit size just a tiny bit bigger. And this kind of held year after year, and it ended up holding for 40 to 50 years, okay? So this is an exponential. Every two years, it doubles the number, the number of transistors on a computer chip, doubles. And it became more than just an observation, it was like a way of life. So all you had to do was design one computer, and then if it didn't run really good, you just waited two years, and all of a sudden the transistors were smaller, and it ran good, okay? So then it shrinks, it's, it's faster, it's faster because the transistors are smaller, 
and it also takes less power. So that's why we're able to have things like portable devices now, because the transistors are so tiny that they don't take as much power. All right. So, and then what, what the other thing we do is, do you think we just kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking? It's like, oh, I got my 200 transistors and now they're really, really take up a tiny bit of area. No, what we do is you shrink it and then you fill up the rest of the chip with more transistors. So that's why when you have a computer chip, it's got this onboard memory that just increases and increases and increases. So that was the ride, right? Everything was great because you just waited two years. You could predict how many transistors would be on a chip in two years, in four years and six, and you could kind of predict how fast it would be. And we went through this period where every like two years, the clock frequency would double. When I first started out, our computers were like 33 megahertz. And then two years later, they were 66. Then they were 133. And then 266. And then it was like 5, 12. And they got up to 1 gigahertz, 1 half gigahertz, 3 gigahertz. And that was like 10 years ago. And now what are they today? 3 gigahertz. And tomorrow they'll be 3 gigahertz. So one of the problems that happened with Moore's Law is that we ran into this barrier about 10 years ago where even though it could make the, the transistors tiny, the transistors became too hot because they were so small, they would melt. And so we actually kind of saw this, this end to the increase in performance that's inherent in Moore's Law because we couldn't run them faster. They would get too hot. And so what you see today is, hey, we still put a lot of transistors on there. We still double the number of transistors. It's just we don't run any faster because they would melt. That's why we're stuck at three gigahertz in terms of like how fast a computer can run. And so this became when I became a professor. So I was like, man, the computer industry is so great. There's so much money in it. So I become a professor of computer engineering and the whole world ends, right? And I'm like, this is sweet. I should have kept my job down at Hewlett Packard. Well, it turns out this isn't the end of the world because we don't really care that computers use transistors. You may not even know what a transistor is, and you don't have to. You can still buy a computer. You're welcome to buy these. It turns out a transistor is just a little device that acts as an electronically controlled switch. But who cares? All we care about is that computers can compute. So we really care about computation. If you look at computation going back the past century, it is an exponential. It turns out that in Moore's Law, we live up here, where it's been an exp exponential using integrated circuits for transistors. But heck, we had switches before. We had vacuum tubes. We even had mechanical relays. Like the computers made noise. So much noise, you couldn't even be in the same room with them. Clang, 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 clang. It would kill you. And then we went into vacuum tubes, discrete computers, or discrete transistors, and then integrated circuits. So that's kind of where we are when I became a professor. So I said, all right, no problem. I'm going to come up with some cool contribution to the computer industry. So I was enamored with this idea of what's called reconfigurable computing. So a regular computer, uh, just a normal computer, we call it a jack of all trades. Okay? The chip in here has everything you could ever want it to do. It's got the adds, it's got the subtracts, it's got the everything. Okay? But you don't use it all at once. You might have gigabytes of memory on here and you only use a little bit of it, you still got the gigabytes, you still buy it. So they're relatively inefficient from a power perspective and a usage of resource perspective. So the idea of reconfigurable computing is that you use a programmable device and you only program it to do what you want at the time. When I say programmable, I don't mean writing software, I'm talking about you can go in and change what the hardware is configured to be. So the actual transistors, they're in a configuration, you wire them up one way to be an adder, I don't need to add anymore, you wire them up a different way to be a subtractor. Okay? I did not invent reconfigurable computing, but I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could do some research and, and like help out with that area? Because I thought it was pretty sweet. And it happened to lead, or it happened to build on stuff that I used to do at Hewlett Packard. So I was like, this is a natural fit, I'm gonna do it. So I started, okay? I got some graduate students, we got a, a, a room, we got so we turned the lights out, we started building these computers, writing software, and we actually were starting to do measurements and figuring out if these were good or bad. And this is like a traditional research project, okay? You get a bunch of plots, you write a paper, you repeat, life is good, okay? So then I went to a conference, this was 10 plus years ago, it was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 
And it turned out that there was a guy there listening to the talk from NASA. And he came up to me afterwards, this was in Idaho, so we were at the potato bar. And he's like, you know what? What you're doing could actually help NASA's computers. I was like, what? No way, this is awesome. I've always wanted to work with NASA or for NASA. And so I'm like, this is amazing. What, what do I need to do here? So I came back to MSU and I started learning everything I could about NASA computers and how this reconfigurable computing could potentially help them, okay? So, the promise of reconfigurable computing. Space computers need to be light, okay? Costs a lot of money to get them up in space. Well, reconfigurable computing uses a small amount of resources and it reprograms it over and over and over. So they're inherently lighter than the jack of all trades approach. Got it. Reconfigurable computer helps with power because you have a smaller piece of circuitry reprogramming over and over and over. All the other unused stuff that's burning power, not used. Check. They have to have high computation. That's the whole point, right? Reconfigurable computing promised to be a little bit better than what we have with our existing computers. So it was like, well, the theory says they should. And then NASA said, they need to operate <coughs> in the presence of harsh radiation. And I was like, okay, you're out of my league right now because I was a computer engineer. So I'm ones and zeros, not radiation. So I had to start understanding what radiation was. And it turned out that it's at a very cartoon level, <clears throat> radiation is sort of understood easy to understand. Once you go too far into it, it's weird. It's physicists, okay? But on a cartoon level, radiation is present in space from our stars, okay? So our stars, hydrogen is the most abundant atom there is, <coughs> right? These hydrogens all get pulled together and they're all there. I got their one proton, one neutron, and then the electrons cycling around and they get pulled together. And they come together and they're like, hey, gravity's pulling us together. This is pretty cool. How you doing? How you doing? It's like, man, there's a lot of gravity. There's a lot of gravity. There's a lot of hydrogen coming in from every way. Boy, this is so much gravity. It's almost too much to take. Is anybody else feeling all this gravity? And all of a sudden, these two hydrogens go like this. <gasps> and they fuse together and they become helium. Okay? And helium has a tiny bit less mass than the two hydrogens combined. And what happens to that little, little mass that was lost? Have you ever heard of E equals MC squared? E is energy, M is mass, so a little bit of mass, but the C, you know what the C is? Speed of light squared! You know what that means? Hydrogen, 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 helium, boom! And it blows everything to bits, including the people that just became helium. So, radiation is everything that you could ever imagine getting blown to bits out of a star. And it's blowing these hydrogens into other things and making all these different materials. So you got hydrogen flying out, you got helium flying out, you got parts of hydrogen, like the electron came flying off, the neutron, the proton, they come out, the neutron and proton get blown apart, they come out, and then you got all this radiation in the form of electromagnetic rays, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it's coming out too. Not only is it coming out, it's coming out at every wavelength that we understand. <coughs> stuff we can see, stuff we can't see, stuff we don't want to see, okay? So this beautiful radiation is just everywhere, and it just has to do with our stars. Now we love radiation, because it keeps us nice and warm, okay? But some of it's really bad, some of it can kill humans, but more importantly, some of it can make our computers crash when they hit the little piece of silicon in here that has our computer on. And that's where NASA says we need to do something about this, okay? All right, so what does it do to computers? Well, a computer, you can think of it as, it's a circuit that has ones and zeros. It's not terribly difficult. You got an input that's a one or a zero, the output's a one or a zero, but you need to know if it's a one or a zero. You can't have the things like accidentally bouncing between a one and a zero. So that's what radiation does. It comes flying in and it takes these nice little transistors which were designed to work perfectly and it like, ah! and all of a sudden your ones become zeros. No good, okay? It's annoying when your computer up here does it, but it's really bad when the computer running your rocket does it. Because one little bit flip, the rocket blows. Okay? You don't want this thing on anything mission critical. You don't want your airplane computer to crash because of radiation hits it, do you? No. Car? Eh. We care less about cars. We let them crash. But it would be nice if they didn't crash. 
It also has other effects, like it, it alters the material, but it turns out that there's other people looking at that. I wanted to look at the ones becoming zeros because I could actually understand that. So I was like, okay, this is great. <clears throat> then I was like, well, wait a minute. There's computers, computers work, right? You're telling me the sun is blasting out all this radiation, but I know I can text and check my email. Why do these work? How is it possible that they work if this is really a case and NASA's willing to spend all this energy trying to fix it? Does anybody have a guess? Yes, Earth. <laughs> Earth is a great place to live, okay? It turns out we got ourselves the molten core in the middle and it's cranking away and it generates a magnetic field. That's why we're all here, okay? That magnetic field goes away, we're dead, okay? But it's not gonna go away for a while, a couple more years. But this magnetic field deflects all this radiation that's harmful away from us. Some of it gets through, but that's sucked up by our atmosphere. So it ding-dongs around all the little particles in our atmosphere. By the time it gets to our computers, it can't even get through the case. So that's why our computers work so well, okay? So this is fantastic. If the, just on a side note, since you're worried about the planet, the, if the magnetic field goes away, what happens is that we have this atmosphere, air, that's held with gravity, but the radiation will actually like do this to it. And it'll like blow it away. So that's the problem. Our, our magnetosphere protects our atmosphere so it can sit around our planet and we can breathe. Once the core stops spinning, like Mars, then there's no magnetic field, that atmosphere, and it's gone, okay? So, but like I said, it, it's not gonna happen for a while. All right, but then it's like, wait a minute, there's computers in space. So how does that work? It turns out NASA's been around for a while. So has the military. And they figured out ways to actually, what would they call harden a computer. They go into the chip, and they do wacky stuff to it. They like shoot gold into it for random reasons. Turns out it's not so random. It actually helps mitigate the problems with radiation. So they do all this really weird stuff to it and they can make a chip that is called a radiation hardened computer. Now, the reason you can buy a computer and it only costs a couple bucks, 10 bucks, is because we make 30 billion a year. If we only made like a couple hundred, these phones would cost like $10 million. Okay, there's a volume aspect of this. So here's the big problem with NAS computers. They know how to do it and it works, okay? But it's very expensive. So the chip that is used on our latest rover, Perseverance, is called the RAD 750. It costs $200,000, okay? <laughs> It was also used on Curiosity 11 years ago, and it was also used in 2002 on a project called Deep Impact. The thing's been around for 20 plus years. It's extremely expensive, but it's the state of the art. It runs at 200 megahertz. It is lagging our computers that we use right now by 20 plus years of performance, and the cost is absolutely astronomical. Yeah? So there's a problem there. So that's what we need to do is try to fix this. Cost feasibility was the push from NASA to say, fix some of the issues with radiation, but also you gotta achieve. You gotta achieve. So we came up with Rad PC. This is MSU's computer. Okay? This is what we have built. You might be thinking, didn't you say the other one was called Rad 750? I said, yes, that's true. You might ask yourself, did you steal the name and just swap 750 with PC? The answer is yes, that's what I did. Okay? Rad PC, that's what it's called. Now, what do we do on Rad PC? Number one, we use a programmable chip for reconfigurable computing, kinda. And what we do on it is we implement a tiered system, like layered approaches which watch for ones becoming zeros and zeros becoming ones, and then we fix it. We can fix it using a variety of techniques. We can do redundancy and we vote. We can use error correction codes and we can go through and compare memory to like a golden copy. So there's like six or seven different layers that we have put onto the Rad PC computer in order to make it tolerant to radiation. This isn't necessarily gonna save everything because we don't do anything about the material degradation, but it turns out that as the transistors get super, super small, 
the material degradation isn't as big of a deal as the ones becoming zeros and the zeros becoming ones. So this is our, the idea that we came up with, okay? So we are like, all right, this is bad, this is sweet, okay? This is sweet. So we started building models and we ran simulations of this and we are like, ah, ah, it's so good, it's better than what's done by NASA, it's, de it's better than what's done with the RAD 750, we're so good, everything's cool, okay? So here's the rub. With NASA, they're not looking for papers, they're looking for proof. So you, if you want to have something in a NASA mission, you got to fly it. What they do is they have this thing called TRL, which stands for Technical Readiness Level. It goes from one, which is just an idea in your head, to nine, which is it is in missions. It's on the space station, okay? You can buy it and you know it's gonna work. So what NASA does is they say, you shall start and you gotta prove that you're gonna move up this thing through flight testing. You start on the ground, do some stuff, but you gotta get off the planet and you gotta do some stuff. Maybe not off the planet, off the ground, okay? So that's what we began doing. We started off with a proof of concept where we went down and showed some NASA engineers the idea of Rad PC. And then they're like, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. Why don't you do a little bit more testing? So then we went to a cyclotron, which is a giant particle accelerator. This one happened to be in Texas. It's essentially the size of a Norm Asbjornsson Hall, but it's underground. And it whips around these little particles and then it comes out of a tube in the wall that's like that big around. I don't know if you can see the tube. There's the tube, there's your FPC, and it, it hits it. And we're like, yeah, it works. So then they're like, well, that's pretty cool. Why don't you do more? So then we said, all right, let's do some balloons. Balloons are the easiest way to get off the ground and get high enough that you're outside the atmosphere. It doesn't take much to get in the black of space. A balloon that is used like for weather balloons or like car dealerships, they'll go up to 100,000 feet and it's black. Like it is black. It's not technically outer space, but you're out of the vast majority of the atmosphere. So you start getting hit with some radiation. And it's like, oh, this is great. So we did eight of these small balloon missions out of Livingston and out of uh, Big Timber. And then we got the opportunity to go on some of the big NASA balloons. For reference, this little guy right there, that's a balloon. You know what that is? That's a semi. This is as big as Cobley Hall on the ground, and when it gets in outer space, it's like a thousand times bigger because there's no air pushing on it. It's like enormous. This is what the Chinese flew across our country a couple months ago, okay? Same thing. It's just these big balloons, load them up with helium, let them go, and they travel using the winds and you use the elevation, you let off air and you take on air in order to go up and down to catch winds and you guide yourself around, okay? NASA's doing this constantly, okay? We got balloons, we got, there's so many balloons in the air right now, it would probably scare you to know that. It might not scare you, but then you'd tell your family and they'd be scared. <laughs> and then they'd be mad at you, okay? They'd be getting texts at all hours of the night. Okay, then we said, <coughs> let's get in outer space. So we got on what's called sounding rocket. Sounding rocket, is a missile. It's the same exact technology as a missile. And it goes fast like a missile. So you load a red PC on this thing, and I'm not, I'm not kidding, it's like this. And it's in outer space. It breaks the sound barrier before it's a foot off the ground. It's going, it's flying. It goes up into outer space, but it doesn't have quite enough energy to stay there and hit orbit, so then it just comes down. So the missions are like 12 minutes. We get in outer space, cool. Didn't hang out there long enough for a lot of radiation, not so cool, but we did show that we could survive a sounding rocket. Well, the first one we didn't. The first one we built this Rad PC, and we said, okay, fly it. We got this little <laughs> pancake back. We're like, oh, is that us? <clears throat> then the second one kind of held together, but we learned how to build the, the structure of it, okay? So then we got the opportunity to go to the International Space Station, and it's like, what? Okay, let me rewind. Ones and zeros, that's me. Space radiation, yeah, at a cartoon level, going above the sounding rocket balloon, hard. So what we did is we then partnered with the Space Science and Engineering Laboratory, which is located on the fourth floor in Cobley Hall. You know all those little uh, antennas on that brick building? You know that those are active antennas that are currently controlling satellites that we have in orbit? These, this outfit has put over 12 small satellites, they're about the size of a loaf of bread, into orbit. 
and we run them. If you ever watch this, when the satellite comes over, those antennas will move. So with it, it'll actually point at it, and then the satellite goes over, and it watches it, and it does this, and it goes down. So you, those are active antennas. They're not just for looks, okay? All right, so we said, all right, let's do it. So how are we gonna get going here? We got the opportunity to go to the space station. So we built this little payload, flew out of Japan for some random reason. This was like Japan's last rocket that they launched, and we didn't get to see it take off. But it went to the International Space Station, and what they do, is they actually just a crew takes it and they plug it into an experiment locker. So there's Rad VC. Yes! That's it! I mean, that really happened. That's zero gravity. The crew is spinning it as he installs it. Make sure to show the MSU logo. Boom. <laughs> so this was like the coolest moment I've ever had. And so that was the first time we got to go to the International Space Station. And we tested it for a year in 2017. And I was like, this is awesome. So then they were like, if you can do that, build your own satellite. So we're like, all right, let's build our own satellites. So we built two small satellites. We call them RadSat. <laughs> <laughs> we built two of them. So we call them RadSat. You'd think we call them one and two. No, no, G and U, because we were going to have graduate students do one and undergraduates do the other, and then we're gonna compare them. So we thought that was really cool. Turned out, didn't do that at all. <laughs> Everybody's worked together, blah, blah, blah. But I do want to point out a couple things. Number one, that's me. Number two, that's the satellite. It's not big, okay? That's Skylar. And look at the M on there, okay? The way that this works, you go to the International Space Station. It's in a box. It goes inside of the International Space Station in a box that's spring-loaded. Then they take, when you're ready to go in orbit, they take the robotic arm, come around to an airlock, and pull it out, point you down so that you're not going to be up there forever. You only get like a year. And then they go, boop, and shoot you out. And then you orbit, coming down. You come down, 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 and then you burn up, and you're gone. But while you're up there, we use the radio antennas over there to talk to the thing. So we go out to Wallops Flight Center out on the East Coast. We actually did get to watch this one. And this is what it looks like from inside. This is a crew member in the cupola thing where the window is. And they are taking pictures of it, getting shot into space. So I don't know if you can see this. But that is the M for MSU on a satellite coming out of the International Space Station. Boom, 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 boom. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. So I was like, OK, that's pretty cool. Let's do it again. But we're going to change it. Put a cat head this time. <laughs> now you might, you might be going, it seems like all you're doing is flying like uh, MSU logos. And that's very true. However, each of these flights tests something new with Rad PC. So we like we add a little protection to the CPU. Then we add a little bit of protection to the data memory. Then we add a little bit of protection to the instruction memory. And we just build and build and build and build. So every one of these is incremental. But I point out to you, this is Chris, that's the satellite, there's the cat head. We go out and watch this, beautiful day in Wallops Island. Up we go. Up we go. Oh my goodness. There's no possible way this is happening again. Boom! <laughs> Cat head! Come down to the International Space Station. How freaking cool is that? So this is awesome. Both of these operated for two years and then burned up. This one burned up last summer. And it was it was cool because when we would we would see it on the computer coming, and then we'd run over to the window up in on my labs on third floor, and we'd watch the antennas over in Kobe Hall, and they'd start up. And then they do 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 so they look over, do, 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 do. then they don't go like this, they turn around, and then they go do, 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 do. So it's, it's awesome, okay? There it goes, there it goes. All right, so now you're like, how do you top that? Impossible, right? Boom, we're going to the moon! So we got funded in 2019 to go to the surface of the moon because we had shown NASA that we were able to fly. So we build this technology, we kept showing it, kept showing it, and we get the opportunity to go to the moon. So, what do we do? Here's what the next century, not century, the next decade looks like. You have heard of Elon Musk, is this true? Starship, okay? He's got a moon rocket. You may have heard of NASA's SLS, Space Launch System. NASA's got a rocket. Those are the two moon rockets that we currently have, okay? The idea is that both of them can carry cargo, both of them can carry crew. 
okay? SLS, the idea is to break trail, it's already launching, but the idea ultimately is to turn it all over to SpaceX, and then hopefully there'll be a follow on SpaceX because they wanna have this be a commercial endeavor. You may not have heard of this. There is also a effort called CLIPS at NASA, which is called the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. When we go to the moon again, it's not to just jump down and hit a golf ball, take some pictures. We're gonna stay there because we're gonna learn how to build habitats and we're gonna learn how to go to Mars from there. We don't know if we're gonna launch from the moon, but we're going to the moon, we're gonna have a space station orbiting the moon, and we're gonna shuttle stuff back and forth. We don't bring everything with us this time, okay? Like we did in Apollo. We are gonna drop off stuff before we get there. So commercial lunar payload services is about enabling private companies to build rockets and build moon landers that can go and drop off stuff so that when the crew gets there, the golf clubs are already there, the food's there, maybe a habitat's there, all right? So, MSU got assigned to one of these uncrewed lunar landers. <clears throat> we are on what's called the 19D, but we are scheduled to go in August of next year, okay? We are on what's called the Firefly Blue Ghost Mission 1 lunar lander. It is gonna go on a SpaceX rocket, okay? You might go, how does SpaceX get you there if it doesn't have Starship? It turns out you can get there with Falcon. So you go up, and instead of just like, boom, to the moon, like they did on Apollo, and like we'll do with SLS, you go like this. You start slowly, you give yourself a boost. It's a little bit more, boost. A little bit more, boost. A little bit more, boost. A little bit more. And you elliptically throw yourself at the moon. It takes longer though. This will take 45 days to get to the moon, as opposed to three days if you do a direct shot with thrusters. You just say, give me all the gas you got, boom. Okay, so it's gonna take 45 days to get there. And this is what we look like. So this is not terribly large. It's about the size of, you know, a cube. This, there's a mock-up of this in the third floor lab, in my third floor lab, where you can actually look at it. It is actually our flight backup but it was supposed to be a flight backup, but it ended up breaking. So we're like, well, we'll just put it in the window so people can see what it looks like. So this, is, this was delivered last year. They're building this, and it's gonna fly in August. NASA has funded six to eight of these companies to build rockets, or not even build rockets, but build lunar landers. They all were supposed to start going in 2022, and they all keep slipping and slipping and slipping. Okay? They're all piled up now. So next year, there's like four of them that are gonna go. Like four different companies that are gonna launch. So next year, if everything stays on track, which it never does, could be remarkable in terms of lunar activity. Okay? So this is gonna be an exciting time to be alive. You wanna know an interesting story? Other, not that this isn't interesting. You know one of the reasons this one got uh, delayed? <clears throat> they were getting their tanks and fuel from Ukraine. So Ukraine apparently has a lot of engineering around like propulsion and a lot of chemicals over there. And they said, we, holy cow, there's a war in Ukraine, it delayed everything. So everybody in America had to start building their own tanks and find, finding their own fuel. So it's just a random kind of interesting segue. This is the team, okay, there's me, again with the little rad PC, there it is. This is what the lander looks like if you're wondering how big it is. So it's like this big, okay? It's actually, it, it's pretty big. It's, it's big, but it's not like the, as big as like uh, the space shuttle. So it's not terribly huge. <clears throat> and when I saw this, we, got, we went to go down and, and look at this mock-up. And I had a student that actually started working for me based on one of these Honors Presents talks, Carson. <clears throat> and, and I was like, Carson, I have to have this. I want you to build me a mock-up and we're gonna put it in Norm Asgrenson Hall so that everybody who walks in to this building knows we're going to the moon and they know what it looks like and it's gonna be the awesomest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he came and he showed, he sent me a picture of a mock-up he built after like a semester. And I was like, oh my goodness, I want it, bring it in. Get a truck, whatever you gotta do, get this in, I have to see this. He comes in the next day and shows it to me. I said, Carson, it's, it needs to be at least three times bigger than this. So, we never got the mock-up, 
Of course he's graduating. But here's Rad PC. It's the size of a spec. I don't even know how he got that on there. But anyway, this is where we're at. We're going to the Mar Crisium. Okay? You know what that stands for? The Sea of Crisis. Don't worry about that. <laughs> the cool thing about the Mar Crisium is you can see it with the naked eye. So when you look at the moon, for some reason the moon don't no road. You always see the same side of the moon. It's always like this. It's always smiling at us. That's cool for this because you can look up and you will be able to see where we land for the rest of eternity. Or until you die. <laughs> Which is, I guess, eternity. <laughs> One of the things we did, so this has been delivered. One of the things we did to try to get people jacked about MSU was we invited the public to send messages to the moon. Did anybody in here send a message? A couple? Yeah, so we got, we, we advertised everywhere. We got videos from the governor, from all of our senators, our congressmen. We got thousands of messages from students. We got multiple thousands of pictures. We put a, like a time capsule thing inside of it, which is basically, we have every edition of the exponent since the beginning of MSU. Uh, we just, everything's on it. Now you're like, where's everything? It's on an SD card. We just put an SD card in there. And, and it's gonna be awesome. Because in a thousand years, somebody's gonna be like, hey, look at this little guy. An SD card? I haven't seen one of these in a while. Plug it in, read the exponent. <laughs> it's awesome. Another thing that happened, which is interesting about MSU research, is we spun this out into another company called Resilient Computing. So a small little business started that was to license the technology of RAPC and try to start a business and see if you could actually grow a company around this. Do you remember Chris from one of those pictures? He's the first full-time employee of Resilient Computing. He started this summer. He got his PhD in May. His dissertation was on RADPC, and he's our first employee. So we just started, it's, it's been in existence for about two and a half years. NASA has funded us with a couple different grants to say, all right, I love the RADPC research. I want to see RADPC in a box. So that's what we're working on right now over there, okay? Now, as we close out here, you gotta be asking, there's a lot of stuff going on here. You must be really tired. And the answer is, I am a little tired, but it turns out I don't do much. I don't even, I can come in the lab, but I'm not allowed to really touch anything, okay? No screwdrivers, I don't get to write any code. This is all done with students. We have had over 150 students work on some part of RADPC over the past 12 to 15 years. Every form possible. We've done senior design projects, We've done freshman uh, research experience scholars. We've done undergraduate scholars program. We've done master's degree students. We've done PhD students. We've done re everything you could ever imagine we have done to get students involved in it. And the, one of my favorite things is the Saturn V. We've had the opportunity, Saturn V was the, the first moon rocket. There's really only been one. The Saturn V. So these are different Saturn Vs that we go around to the different centers and get the students' pictures in front of them. So the, and this right here, I don't know if you can see that. Balloon flight out of Big Timber. That's a moose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is my story about my research and Rad PC. And so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Beautiful question, beautiful question. So, it turns out, number one, it's heavy to get mass into orbit. So it's very expensive. Then it turns out there's a real weird thing that happens where if you make your shield too thick, that high energy stuff can actually get inside of it and it starts hitting stuff, breaking it loose, and then it scatters. And it'll actually create more radi, it'll actually create more particles that come out the end of it. And so if you put like an inch of lead, that would actually be worse than a quarter inch of lead. And it's because it goes into the material and just ding, 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 and then it comes out like a shotgun. So you can get enough lead to stop everything, but the estimate is that you'd need three feet of it in order to stop everything. One of the things they do, if you were to guess on the moon, so they're not protected by anything. There's no magnetic core, there's no atmosphere. What do you think their strategy is if we got people on the moon golfing? 
and a big solar storm goes off, and here comes everything. They hide underground. Hide underground. <clears throat> because it turns out dirt is pretty good. So the moon dirt will stop it. So one of the things that they're going to do, first thing, is they'll dig a hole. They're probably not going to dig it. We're probably going to drop off a robot to do it. But they're going to dig holes and build like a little shelter so that when there's a big solar storm, it's like, boom, they can see it. And then they're like, well, we better go in the basement. And then they wait, and then they come back out. It turns out when we went to the moon, we were lucky because we were in between these solar maximums. So it just happened that there wasn't a ton of solar activity when we went to the moon in the 60s and 70s. And then right after that, there was a lot of it. So if we would have timed it wrong, there's a chance that our, our folks could have got fried. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Yes? What's the like, cooling situation that you guys have? The cooling on this, so this, it's actually interesting. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't get terribly hot on the moon mission. So when we go, the problem with being in space is if you're in direct sunlight, it gets too hot. And what they do is they wrap everything in this thing called MLI and it's called multi-layered insulation. So whenever you see a satellite or anything going to space, you notice how it's always wrapped like a gold blanket? That's a reflection blanket. And the, the curse in space is direct sunlight because there's nothing slowing it down and it just cooks you, cooks electronics. So they wrap everything in this and it reflects it. But we're gonna be exposed on this side because we have a radiation detector. And so we have this really expensive uh, silver tape that will try to reflect it. But everything in here, we're gonna have a blanket around every part of this, and then what we're trying to do is reflect everything there. So the models right now show that we, oh, and then the other thing they do is because some things are exposed when they go to the moon, the little sh spacecraft actually rotates. So they do a barrel roll. So that it's just like a, like a rotisserie chicken. So you're just cooking like one side of it on the way. So everybody will heat up, cool down. Heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down. When we get on the moon, we'll be there two weeks, and we will get to a point where we get up to one situation for like a day where we're over where we should be, and we're just gonna shut off and wait it out. And then once we come down in temperature, then they'll turn us back on. So we were worried about being cold, and it turns out not, a, not an issue at all, because it's easy to heat up. You just take batteries, and you just run it through all the metal. So that's what they do on this thing, is they have these decks, and they're just currents running through them, and they're just warm. And so everybody just bolts to them. It's like, oh yeah, that's great. But the problem is the cooling, like you said. So it's all about reflecting that radiative uh, energy coming out. Yes? Um, what do you think about quantum computing? Changing quantum computing, very cool. When I was a student, everybody said, quantum computing is gonna change everything. And then 20 years later. <laughs> but we're closer now than we were, right? So there is existence for quantum computing could be phenomenal, okay? It could be phenomenal. It's more of just trying to figure out like the cooling of it and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, that could be revolutionary, potentially. So that's like, like you know when you're talking about computation, yeah. the next natural step would be, well, quantum computing is the next one. I said, well, I'm gonna work on this reconfigurable computing as like a different approach. Then I went into the NASA stuff. And so if I would have stepped with stayed with reconfigurable computing, I would guess that I would have probably came back and tried to work in quantum. But what ended up happening with me is I ended up just pivoting and I was like, I'd rather do the NASA stuff because that's awesome for me. Right. And so then I stayed in this area. But we do have quantum stuff here. I mean, we're building quantum materials and it, it's really hard to build it. That's what it's all about. You can understand roughly how it works, but it's hard to build it. Yes? Is resilient computing working on the RAD PC or are they going yes. down different avenues as no. well? No, RAD PC 001. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem with a research computer is it's a bunch of students that tuck, duct tape it together and it works, kinda, for one mission. But if you wanna do anything, like I need to tweak some software, you have to pull the whole thing apart, get inside, tweak it, and then put the whole thing back together. That's how all research experiments are, is they're very one-off. 
So what resilient computing is trying to do is say, okay, if you want a rad PC to be something you could buy, it's got to look like like an Arduino, really. It's a little Arduino or Raspberry Pi. You buy it, it comes in a box. You plug in a USB cable, do, 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 program it, get it all working, and then you get it in your, your spacecraft and you go, well, we also have the added benefit that it's radiation tolerant. See ya. So yeah, that's what resilient computing is doing. And the reality is you can never get there at a university because we're always going for the next thing. Right? We're always like, we're not gonna stop making a product. We're always like, what can we do after the moon? So. Yes? So it sounds like with this product, it's gonna be obviously put on the mission critical system. No, so that's a whole break. <laughs> on this um, land or what is it gonna be controlling? <coughs> Nothing. 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 We are, actually everything on here is an experiment. So what NASA did is they gave the company, like I think the contract was $100 million, because they want them to build a lander and figure out how to get them. Then it was like, well, are we gonna carry anything? It's like, yeah, hang on. Then they came out and they said, people can write proposals to build payloads. <clears throat> and we ended up, MSU won one of those, and those were smaller amounts. So there's 12 different, I think there's eight to 12 payloads that are just science experiments and tech demos that just come along and they bolt onto this and it gives this company, Firefly, something actionable to do as opposed to just going and landing. So it gives them more experience of like, okay, I can carry payloads because what we do is we just, all we do with our FPC is, is run a counter program and then we get blasted by radiation and we, we log information about who got hit, where it was, how fast do it take for us to recover? And we just dump that to this lander and then they turn around and send it back to Earth. So we're just like this passive experiment that's just running and dumping data. And that's how a lot of the experiments are. There are some experiments that are gonna do things like they're gonna vacuum up dirt. Uh, there's a couple that are really weird where they wanna measure the impedance of the dirt, which is like the resistance of it. So they actually have these little explosive things. So they're like, you can't, there's no party to walk out and like stick a probe here and stick a probe here. So they take these probes and they pyrotechnic it out and, and then they turn on a voltmeter or impedance meter and be like, oh, two ohms. Interesting. And then they beam that back to Earth. So there's some wacky ones on there. There's some simple ones. There's also a retro reflector. Has anybody ever heard of the retro reflector? So one of the things Apollo did is they left these reflective uh, disks. <clears throat> and there's these, there's these big lasers in Arizona that shoot at the moon and they measure the round trip time and they can figure out if the moon is moving away or moving closer to us. And they just release that it's actually moving away from us. Very small, though. don't worry about it. It's like, it's like three centimeters in a hundred years or something like that. But, there's a little retro reflector on here and they're gonna see if they can do the same thing but using a smaller reflector. Yes? Are all of the students that work under you electrical or computer engineers? Almost all are. Uh, when I partner with Space Science and Engineering Laboratory, they're the ones that have the expertise in like building the structure. So they mechan, but it's all students, right? It's like you can work for them, work for me, but the mission's the same. And so it's almost just like, who's your advisor or who's your boss at the time? And so all the mechanical people and the physics students, they tended to be from the space science and engineering laboratory. But it really, it is, it's electrical, computer, computer science, mechanical, and physics are the main degrees that you see in like space stuff, at, at least at MSU. Yes? Uh, can you elaborate a little more on the material degradation due to radiation and then solutions for that? Yeah, it's, it's called total ionizing dose. And what it does is when you are current, electrical current, you travel down a conductor. And you don't want to go anywhere else except down that conductor. So you are surrounded by what we call an insulator, which is not gonna let you go. So it, transistors basically have conductors and insulators on them, a lot of them. What happens with the material degradation is that that charge that comes from the stars, it goes into the insulator and it, it basically gets stuck. And it like shoots an electron in there and then shoots this and shoots that and it turns the insulator into a conductor. So what happens is that over time, the material just slowly kind of oozes. 
and it just like lets current kind of leak. So what happens with the material degradation is that it usually starts drawing too much current, and once it gets to the point where it's drawing too much current because all the conductors are oozing into the insulators, because the insulators aren't insulators anymore, then it just burns up. So that's the failure mechanism. What they do is they try to minimize the insulator thickness. So if you're this thick, and here comes a particle, yeah, stuck. But if you're yeah, this thick, here comes a particle, goes right through, doesn't even leave a hole. Or if it does, it's small. And so you can minimize how much effect the particles have when they hit the material. The problem is that that's really custom. Our computers are like, they're the thick ones. So that's, we sell billions of these a year, 10 of these a year. So that's why these are so expensive. Any other questions? Yeah. How do you stay so passionate doing it for so long? How do I stay so passionate? Yeah. This is awesome. How can you not be? This is the coolest stuff ever. I mean, I'm not biased. I don't want to be biased, but have you ever heard of anything cooler than this? <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I mean NASA is all cool. I just I love NASA, love space, all that stuff. And that's like be able to do stuff with it. That's cool. So, and, it, and it's fun also being a professor because you, you teach, you teach people about the stuff, then they want to work in your lab, so you have to like teach the low level classes, then the high level classes, and then all of a sudden they're like, wow, this guy's a skill that is actually usable. Come work in the lab. And then it's like, oh my gosh, and then they graduate, and then they make way more money than you. That part sucks. But all the rest of it is awesome. Yes. Yes. I want to go back to the cooling thing. How do you, or is the like, heat generated by the computer itself not yes. going to be an issue? Or? No. It turns out us being on helps us stay warm. And so they do models of like, you generate heat, it's watts. And it turns out that if we weren't on, we would get really cold. So we would absolutely need the lander to warm us up so we don't just like start freezing. So the fact that we run and burn our own power is good. We had to do an analysis, a simulation calculation, to figure out is the heat we're generating too much? Because the problem is that if you get isolated, you can run away. The heat just is, is more and more and more and more. So it turned out that we had enough like excess area to radiate off the heat within the lander itself and not get too hot. So for this, for us, it just happened that the design worked. And it, it's not like we just made a design and then we're like, hope it works. It's the, that's what a mechanical engineer does, right? They design stuff and they're constantly looking at whether it's strong enough, whether it's thermally okay. So that's part of the mechanical design. It was cool to watch. I didn't really understand any of it, but other than what I'm telling you. Are you a mechanical engineer by chance? No, I'm a computer science major. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pretty sweet. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So for this kind of work, would you recommend like so like yeah for this kind of work with like um, computers and whatnot, like with the actual building and stuff, would you recommend like pursuing an electrical engineering degree or a computer engineering degree? All of the above, honestly, because with I mean at a university, honestly, to build something quick with undergraduate skills, the skills that you see come together really quickly are electrical computer, computer science. So you'll notice it's like, I want to build a robot. <clears throat> it's usually like an electrical and a computer and a computer science that just like get together and they're the ones that crew. When you do the big stuff though, like the mechanical design becomes critical. So like when we went big and went to the moon, the mechanical became a huge, a huge part of it. When you go bigger than that and you start worrying about the propulsion, that's when you bring in like this chemical people and then it gets like you've got chemical engineers and then you get into the space where you're like man this stuff is really complicated we might need actual scientists so when you look at big big space missions they've got every engineer and you're going to laugh at this even civil because they're talking about going to the moon and digging holes and for an electrical engineer i'm like bring a shovel <laughs> and they're like, no, you won't believe this. It's like powder for two inches, then almost concrete. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> you never figured that out. So even civils are on this stuff. And then you get the science involved in it because physicists and chemists and astrophysicists, so the whole science people come together because 
This one is about delivering cargo, but really there's also science on this too. So space, big space is crazy how many different how many different disciplines are in there. And then the business, anybody in business? Holy moly, the money involved in this stuff is outrageous. And yeah, all of the above. All right, any, any last questions before we hit five? All right.